Th thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Mato, and thanks for organizing and, and chairing this uh, hugely important event. And I have to say, it's a, it's a particular honor to be following both uh, President Nasheed, an old friend of mine, and as you say, the Mandela of the Maldives and uh, a global leader on, on climate action in, in every sense of the term. And of course, uh, uh, Secretary Kerry, whose appointment has been welcomed, I think, by everyone who cares passionately about these issues um, and who has an enormous amount of work to do um, as a consequence of events in the last few years. Um, so I should start by saying my friend and, and colleague, uh, COP26 President Alok Sharma, is very sorry indeed that he can't be with you. He's looking forward to addressing the summit on Friday. Um, and again, before I get into the heart of the issue, I, I'd like to express my, on behalf of the UK government, my very deepest sympathies for the appalling situation that India is facing in Uttarakhand. Um, I send my, my heartfelt condolences to all those affected. Um, so the, the World Sustainable Development Summit has already brought together um, a, a range of, of, of key people to discuss rebooting green growth at what is a critical time. Because alongside the enormous human suffering uh, that we've seen, the coronavirus pandemic has caused immense economic damage right across the world. There are parts of the world that have barely been touched by the uh, virus itself, and yet their economies have nevertheless been hammered. Um, and its impact is undoubtedly going to reverberate for many years to come. But the effect of the decisions that we take now as we repair the damage caused by the pandemic is, will last far longer. The choices we make today will decide whether or not we lock polluting emissions into our economies for years to come or whether we lay the foundations for clean, sustainable, resilient growth. So we've got to get this right. Uh, and the bottom line is that if we're to meet the aims of the Paris Agreement, uh, limit global temperature rises and adapt to an inevitably changing climate, as Secretary Kerry made the point earlier, we need to break the link between economic growth and environmental devastation. And I think that is probably the single greatest challenge. <laughs> So much of what we're here to discuss, dangerous climate change and the environmental devastation that is in part causing it, are the consequence of market failure. Failure, in other words, of the market to properly value natural systems on which all of us depend, and failure to apply a cost to pollution, waste, and environmental damage. And clearly that needs to change. The world agreed the Paris aims together, united in 2015, and that was in large part thanks to the appeal made by those countries most vulnerable to climate change, not least the world's small island states like the Maldives. Uh, we know now what needs to be done, and we know that doing the right thing will not only be the right thing, it'll generate jobs, opportunities, and prosperity around the world. So aligning our, our recovery packages with the Paris Agreement and with nature and with the Sustainable Development Goals means growing our economies, creating jobs, and supporting development. And we've heard from many leading economists who believe that green recoveries create more jobs, uh, increase short-term returns, and reduce long-term costs. And the market is already shifting very, very quickly. For example, solar and wind uh, are already cheaper than coal in two thirds of the world. Who would have anticipated that the cost of solar would fall 90% since the banking crisis just 12 years ago? Uh, we've already heard the Indian renewable sector employs today, I believe, 800,000 people. Nigeria is using off-grid solar to connect 5 million people to power. And globally, the World Bank believes that we could save 140 million working years every single year if power freed people from the need to collect fuel and allowed them to uh, cook faster, for example. Tasks, incidentally, that are overwhelmingly performed by women and girls. And it's worth noting uh, that here in the UK, uh, talking about breaking that link between devastation and economic growth, we did cut emissions by 42% since 1990, while also growing the economy by more than two thirds. So the UK COP presidency wants to put climate, environment, and the need for an accelerated global transition to green growth at the heart of the recovery. We're working to strengthen adaptation, to secure a step change on emissions reductions, and to get finance crucially, finance flowing to climate action. We're urging governments to make ambitious net zero commitments, of course, 
and to present nationally determined contributions that reflect that goal. Here in the UK, our new uh, NDC keeps us on track to meet what is now a legally binding commitment to net zero by 2050. And we're working with donor countries, development banks, multilateral climate funds and investors to get finance flowing to developing countries to hasten mitigation and adaptation there. The, the COP26 president, Alok Sharma, has been very clear that donor countries need to honour their commitments on international climate finance. We're not going to get where we need to go without that commitment being honoured. And they need to, com uh, I say they, we need to demonstrate that, that we will meet and surpass the $100 billion a year commitment that was made. And next month, the COP presidency is going to hold a climate and development ministerial to find ways forward on critical issues faced by those most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. And I know he will be saying much more about this when he addresses the summit on Friday. Bottom line is we know we'll only succeed, as AJ, as you said, if we raise ambitions and work together. That's why our COP26 campaigns are bringing together governments, financial institutions, business and civil society. And we're focusing on five key areas that are critical to tackling the crisis. Finance, adaptation, clean energy, clean transport, and in many ways, most important of all, nature. And I say most important because we know there is no pathway to net zero or indeed the sustainable development goals that does not involve a massive increase in our efforts to protect and restore nature. Nature-based solutions to climate change could provide around a third of the cheapest and most cost-effective solution to climate change. And yet, inexplicably, it receives less than 3% of global climate finance today. And that's got to change and it's got to change fast. In the UK, we have already committed to doubling our climate finance to 11.6 billion. But crucially, a few weeks ago, the Prime Minister pledged that around a third of that will be invested in nature-based solutions. And we're urging other countries to put a similar emphasis on nature. Uh, we know that if we work together, we can solve this crisis. And I really appreciated hearing what Secretary Kerry uh, said earlier and the optimism with which he said it. We know that we can do it, and we know that we can do it in a way that ushers in, if we get it right, a cleaner, greener, healthier, and more resilient world. And as I say, we can only do that by working together, and I look, very for look forward a great deal to working with all of you to achieve that. Thank you.